And here they are uh, with John Cleese. They're all sitting around deciding how to rebel, how they're going to make demands against the Romans. They are zealots who are going to rebel against the Romans. And one of them says, well, I want to be, I want the right to become a woman. Here's that scene. I want to have babies. You want to have babies? It's every man's right to have babies if he wants them. But you can't have babies. Don't you oppress me. I'm not oppressing you, Stan. You haven't got a womb. Where's the fetus going to just take? You're going to keep it in a box? Here, I've got an idea. Suppose you agree that he can't actually have babies, not having a womb, which is nobody's fault, not even the Romans, but that he can have the right to have babies. Good idea, Judith. We shall fight the oppressors for your right to have babies, brother. Sister, sorry. What's the point? What? What's the point of fighting for his right to have babies when he can't have babies? It is symbolic of our struggle against oppression. Symbolic of his struggle against reality. (laughs) Struggle against reality. So this routine came to mind as I was watching Rand Paul masterfully question Rachel Levine, a guy who thinks he's a woman, who is up for the appointment to the uh, Health and Human Services Division as a deputy, something other, other deputy director or something like that. And Rand Paul is questioning him about whether he is thinks that children should be able to determine their gender and have their breasts removed or their testicles removed or have their hormones blocked without the consent of their parents, right? They, without the consent of their parents. And Rand Paul is questioning him. And I have to say, there was a moment watching this when I thought I was watching Monty Python. Here's a, a clip. Do you support the government intervening to override the parent's consent to give a child puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and or amputation surgery of breasts and genitalia? For most of our history, we believe that minors don't have full rights and the parents need to be involved. So I'm alarmed that you won't say with certainty that minors should not have the ability to make the decision to take hormones that will affect them for the rest of their life. Will you make a more firm decision on whether or not minors should be involved in these decisions? Senator, uh, transgender medicine is a very complex and nuanced field. Uh, And if confirmed to the position of Assistant Secretary of Health, I would certainly be pleased to come to your office and talk with you and your staff about the standards of care and the complexity of this field. I'm sorry, you can call me a bigot till the cows come home. When they cut to that guy and his necklace and his wig and his, I mean, all I could think of it was, was I, I'm watching Monty Python. I'm watching a comedy routine. And, and you know, this is, this is the thing. The, the British have always found it absolutely hilarious for men to dress up in women's clothes. And when I lived in England, lived in England for many years, I used to watch it and I would think, why is every comedy show got some guy dressed up in women's clothes? And the funny thing about it is it's just funny. It's funny the way a man changing a diaper is funny and a woman changing a diaper isn't. I mean, if you've ever, you know, you, you have a movie, Three Men and a Baby. The minute you hear the title, you know it's funny. Three Men and a Baby, you know that that movie is gonna be pretty funny. If it were called Three Women and a Baby, it wouldn't be funny, right? That's that's the truth. Now, if you're like me, one of your favorite things to do is go to the post office, wait online with people coughing all over you and uh, get a stamp or something. Uh, if you're a sane human being, you want to go and use stamps.com. Stamps.com brings you all the services of the post office in your computer where they belong. Stamps.com has saved businesses thousands of hours and tons of money. You get the services of the post office and UPS all in one place, plus big discounts on mailing and shipping rates. Stamps.com brings the services of the U.S. Postal Service and UPS right into your home. Anything you can do in the post office except wait online, you can do it. Stamps.com. So stop wasting time going to the post office. Go to Stamps.com. Instead, there's no risk. And with my promo code, Claven, Claven, try and remember that, you get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale, no long-term 
commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in Clavin. That's stamps.com, promo code Clavin, stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. I say it slowly because you otherwise you will not know how to spell it, sound it out. It is K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no E's in Clavin. I just make it look this easy. Here, here is just as a segment, one of the segments that just came to mind is I, I feel like I feel like we are absolutely being, you know, we're being scammed so badly that it's almost impossible for us to speak up because we can't believe it's happening. But here is John Cleese uh, doing a uh, dressed up as a woman being interviewed about uh, her relationship with a famous character it's supposed to be it's a mock documentary. Dinsdale was a perfectly normal person in every way. Except, except in as much as he was convinced that he was being watched by a giant hedgehog. <laughs> he referred to as Spiny Norman. How big was Norman supposed to be? Normally he was wont to be about 12 feet from snout to tail, but when Dinsdale was very depressed, Norman could be anything up to 800 yards long. When Norman was about, Dinsdale would go very quiet and his nose would swell up and his teeth would start moving about and he'd become very violent and claim that he'd laid Stanley Baldwin. Dinsdale was a gentleman. What's more, he knew how to treat a female impersonator. <laughs> he was a perfectly normal man, except for the 800-yard long hedgehog, but he knew how to treat a female impersonator. <laughs> Again, it's a terrible thing to talk about why comedy is funny, but it's funny when men dress up as women because the way women dress is, is important in ways that the way men dress isn't. That is just the truth. You know you're living in a decadent society when the way men dress becomes as important the way women dress. When men wear ties and the suits and they basically change their tie and that's about it. But women, you know, you know what it means if I say to you, oh, she was dressed in a very feminine way. You know what that means. You know what it means if I say she was dressed modestly or if I say she was dressed in a wild and wacky way. You know, you know what these things mean. And one of the things, this is in um, uh, Thomas Mann's famous book, The Magic Mountain. And it's just a great observation that he observes the fact that women's actual bodies are part of their dress. I mean, women bear parts of their bodies, their arms, you know, their back and things like this. They they bear parts because they are beautiful in and of themselves. So the way women dress speaks about women's roles in society, women's roles in the sexual game that we all are here to play, and women's roles in the sexual dance, I should call it, we're all here to play. And when men take that on, it's inherently funny. It's inherently funny. And now we are living in these comedy routines. It is just amazing to me. It is just amazing to me that comedy has become reality in America because we are living in the big grift. (laughs) 